me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's awesome to see all of you, and for those who are online, we miss you being here, but really grateful that you can participate and just that we're able to be together, be able to worship together and open up God's Word together. Uh, as we've been going through 2 Timothy and just the encouragement that it is, uh, I know it's been encouraging to me. I just think about this season and the last two years. This has been a great letter uh, for me to go through, and I hope it's been encouraging to you. Uh, before we get into this next section, kind of getting to the last two parts of it this week and next week, uh, but get it, before we get into this next section, let's pray together, and then we'll get into the Word. God, we thank you so much, uh, just again, for your presence. We thank you, God, for your love for us. We thank you, God, I'm just grateful for this church family and what you're, what you're doing in this place, how you're providing, how you protect, how you walk with us, how you guide us. Uh, God, whether people are sitting in the room or watching online, I pray that you would just give us an awareness of your presence, of your love, uh, an awareness that we're not alone. Um, I pray that, God, you would lay, give us a burden for one another and for those around us. Most importantly, God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. And so as we get into your word, God, I pray, Spirit, that you would move in this place. I pray that you would be the one speaking. I pray that we would know that you are here and that we would hear you. And so challenge us with the ways we need to be challenged. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, I'm a big movie person, and one of the most common movie tropes in adventure films um, is the idea of a journey through a difficult land. How many times do we see a movie where the heroes, the protagonist, goes on a journey? Uh, our family watched Jungle Cruise this summer. It's a very good movie. Uh, and it's a movie, it's the movie like what I'm referring to, to find the idea of that one, to find this tree that they're looking for. They had to cross through an inordinately d difficult jungle. And the only way they were going to survive, the only way they were going to get there was with a map and with a guide. That's the template, right? <laughs> if there's a really long journey, you need a map and you need a guide. And you could probably think of all the different movies that would have that kind of phenomenon in it, whether it's an older one or a newer one, to get, you're going on a dangerously hard journey, so you need a guide and a map to get, know where you're going and know how to get there. Life mimics art, doesn't it? Or sometimes vice versa. And the same template can be said for our journeys. Regardless of the different seasons that we're in, the different things that we're going through, the things that we're struggling through, trying to figure out whatever the new stuff is or the old stuff, life can be difficult and it can be, feel dangerous at times. And in that, we need a map and we need a guide. Um, that doesn't mean to blow something off or minimize it. It's just the reality that in what we see in 2 Timothy, Paul is going to speak to Timothy about this very concept. And it's really about as practical as it could get. I mean, if there was ever a more, this is the most practical part and straightforward part of the entire letter is, it's going to be really, really hard. You need a guide and you need a map. And so that's the way he begins the first part. The journey of life will indeed get difficult. The journey of life will indeed get difficult. It says in the first verse in chapter three, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. I mean, he says it pretty straightforward, right? Um, many of you know, I also, as well as pastoring here, I also teach at Moody Bible Institute here in this uh, city, and the class I primarily teach is hermeneutics, which is basically Bible interpretation. How do we interpret the Bible? Um, some have survived. Um, I, I tell my students at the very beginning of the semester, anybody that's ever been to college has always had that one class that they said was the hardest and had the most work. So I just claim that spot and tell them this is going to be really hard and you're going to have a lot of work. And I don't apologize for it because I think the importance, we need it for the class that we're in. Well, one time I had a student come up to me at the end of the semester and say, there was just a lot of work in this class. And I said, I told you in the beginning there was going to be a lot of work in the class. He said, well, yeah, I know, but I didn't think you were going to be, you were serious. I'm like, well, that was kind of on you then, right? Because I told you it was going to be a lot of work. I told you this was going to be hard. A lot of times I think we kind of have that student's mentality is like, why is life so hard? God, why is life so difficult? I told you it was going to be hard. <laughs> and I told you it was going to be difficult. And Paul is serious. He's serious here. He's pointing to a healthy perspective of reality that we have to have. Life 
will be rough at times. Life is going to be difficult. Paul's not trying to be a downer here. He's just being honest, and he's not saying anything that Jesus didn't also say. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Even Jesus says you will have trouble. So really, Paul gives us a good reality check here. Do we have healthy expectations about God in life? Because bad expectations are, I won't have trouble following Jesus. I won't feel sadness following Jesus. I won't experience rejection, betrayal, or hurt from others. Life will be easy. Those are all really bad expectations because they're just not true. That's not what's going to happen. Healthy expectations are, the God who has worked in my life isn't done with me yet. Hence why Paul keeps telling Timothy, remember, 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 don't forget what's come before. Healthy expectation is this moment that I'm in isn't my identity, nor is it my end game. There's more to me and my story. God is doing more than just the difficulty of this moment. Another one, God provides wisdom through his word and community on how to keep going. Those are good expectations. But Paul's cutting to the chase. It's going to be difficult. You have to have that expectation. But then he gets pretty specific on what the difficulty is going to be. And so a larger chunk here, starting in verse 2. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women. I feel the need to make a clarification here. That is not a description of all women throughout all time and space. Um, The idea of at this time and education and how it was handled Women weren't as trained or educated as the men at that time, typically. But in the church, that was different. In the church, the women had more opportunities. And so this wasn't a gender issue, it was an education issue. They will come along and they will prey on the weak-minded. In reality, we could say that about both men and women in our world today. And so don't take this just as a gender thing. Is that good? Is that Okay, so just to thought one of the women would say amen or something like that, but hey, we're a woman, whatever. Um, Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. There's a lot in this paragraph, and really none of it's good, Um, like none of it. And Paul says it's going to get difficult because you're going to be wading through this. This is what the culture is going to be like. This is, and Paul's talking about this a long time ago, but as we went through and read through that, does any of that seem ancient? No, it's pretty current and seems almost unfortunately normal to us. Paul's telling us it's going to get difficult. He gives this list of actually 19 cultural descriptions, but it can be summarized with one phrase, self-obsessed. The world is self-obsessed. Everything is about the individual. And really, the idea of self-obsessed can be summarized in the love statements that he makes. Lovers of self. The world, I am center. We live by... Uh, I am center, it's about me, it's what I want, it's what I think. Really, the way that mindset is can be summarized, uh, can be kind of captured in the hypocritical proclamation, you can't tell me what to do. The reason why I say that's a hypocritical proclamation is to tell somebody you can't tell me what to do is to tell somebody what to do, and we don't realize how we are hypocrites. And so, but that's how our world operates. I'm, I am obsessed with me. Lovers of money, stuff is my pursuit. What am I going to get out of this? Lovers of pleasure, feelings in the moment receive my heart. 
and receive my worship. Whatever makes me happy, that's what's most important. There are also those who, in culture, who prey on the vulnerable, those who are hurting, those who are un, 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 um, unexperienced, who, uh, who are in a, in a hard place, who are struggling. And the, the vulnerable are those who are burdened with sin. Anything that would bring about shame, guilt, or consequences, they're allowing that into their lives. Anyone sinning to continue and to build up, allowing sin to continue and build up rather than eradicating it. That is those who are burdened with sin. And they're people that prey on such people. There's also those who are led astray by various passions. We think through the love statements that I already mentioned it's that if whatever I feel, whatever I think, whatever I want, whatever makes me feel good, I'm going to pursue that above all else, allowing passions to lead rather than keeping things under control or thinking about what it means for others. Always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Continually questioning, continually processing, again, which is great, but never becoming a new creation like what Jesus offers us, allowing self-obsession to be fed from outside rather than being transformed by Jesus. To be the person of God wants us to be within a culture that loves itself, loves money, loves pleasure, is burdened by sin, is easily led astray, and is never embracing truth, that's really hard. It's hard to be like Jesus in a world that doesn't want to be like him. But the reality is it's hard because God calls us to something higher. God calls us to something more meaningful. God says, I want you to be a person like this, and it's not like that. And so that's why it's hard, because we're not going with the norm. We're doing something different. If the culture can be summarized by self-obsessed, Jesus' kingdom is one of self-surrender. I'm surrendering who I am to God. You can actually put Jesus obsessed up there as well as a synonym to this reality. And what does that look like? Well, rather than not loving yourself, people who are self-surrendering to God love God and love people. It's about how do I love God with all my heart and people as myself. Rather than loving money, it's being a generous, good steward of the resources God has given me. Rather than loving pleasure, which loving pleasure is all about the moment and how I feel about now and me. The opposite of that, within a godly perspective, is having a larger, wider, wider, caring view of the world. Not just me in the moment, but people around me, beyond me, and what's happening with them. Not burdened by sin, but pursuing holiness. Not easily led astray, but discerning and responsible never embracing truth, but instead having a hunger for truth and righteousness. To be the people of God is to be different. To live the life on the right goes against the life on the left, but this is what God has called us to. It's hard to be the people of God when the world around us is living based on another focus and on different values. It doesn't mean that there isn't good in our world. It doesn't mean that there aren't good things happening. But at the core, the reality of what the world defines itself on and how it, what it pursues, it's not the same thing as the kingdom of God. So this is beyond the normal difficulties of adulting and relationships and parenting and career and education and all that. What Paul is talking about is how difficult it is to do all those things in a way that honors Jesus. If society is collectively moving away from God, the Christian moving toward God goes against the cultural flow. And in that, you will feel it. Have you ever been in like maybe in a river or a stream or lazy river, some body of water that had a current going one way and you were trying to move the other? You could feel the water pushing on you. You can feel the pressure. You can feel the tension. And that's what Paul is saying that living the Christian life will feel like at times. There's going to be times where you feel like you're going against the current and it's difficult to move, and that is because it is. And so we have to think that through. Do we go toward Jesus or are we going with the cultural flow? I mean, are you feeling the tension of following Jesus? If we think following Jesus isn't hard, 
maybe it's because we're doing it wrong. If we never feel spiritual tension, maybe it's because we're not doing it right. Are we actually embracing the character and heart and plan of God? Are we embracing our culture? And we have to be really mindful of what that means, because by culture, it isn't just this big, huge blanket. There's different ideas of culture. And so a, a, a liberal idea of culture can look at the conservative idea of culture. The conservative idea of culture can look at the liberal idea of culture. What I'm talking about is stepping back from both of them and seeing how they're both messed up. Because if you just go from one to the other, it doesn't mean that you're flowing in the path of God. And so if, if we are truly trying to be the people of God that he wants us to be, living faithful to the life he has provided us, you will feel the tension of the flow going against you. And so if you're not, you have to ask yourself, why not? Is it because I'm going in the current is it because, because even the idea of just kind of not thinking about it means you're kind of probably floating along with the current, not realizing you're moving in the right direction. And so we have to be mindful. Life will get difficult at times. Following Jesus will be difficult at times. But Paul makes it clear to Timothy, this is to be expected. But you can get through it. You can keep, you can persevere in it. You can have tenacity in it. You can be faithful in it because you can navigate the difficulties with a guide and with a map. And so he says you need a guide. Life is going to be difficult. You need a guide. Keep, fo keep going by following godly examples. Keep going by following godly examples. He says in verse 10, you, Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Ichnium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord, from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We need to have a godly example in our life. We need to have Paul's. Daniel had Mr. Miyagi, Luke had Obi-Wan, the fellowship had Gandalf, Harry had Dumbledore, try to give everybody something there you can connect with. Um, you have, or if you don't, you understand the kind of template there. We understand the need to have somebody who's walked in a particular season of life come alongside us as we walk through the same season for the first time. It may be somebody much older, but that doesn't always have to be the case. It may just be somebody who's a bit down the road, but either way, they get it. They understand where we're at. They understand what, we've gone, what we're going through because they've gone through it. The difficulty we experience is something that they've experienced. And so it might be a, a stage in life thing. It might be a stage in school thing. It might be a parenting thing. It might be a medical thing. It might be a career thing. But somebody is in this, has been in the same place you are, and they get it. And what Paul is saying, as far as spiritual life goes, you need somebody who gets it who has been where you're at in your season. In light of the spiritual difficulties within a self-absorbed culture, Paul gives himself as the contrast. And Paul listing out all of these things about himself isn't to be cocky, it isn't to, to brag, he's not like giving this like selfie and resume, like, hey, look at how awesome I am at Paul. Paul is trying to help his young friend have a proper outlook and re on reality, and Timothy knows every single thing that Paul mentions is true because he's seen it, and he has seen how Paul is an arrow pointing to Jesus. And I think the other thing that's really important when we think about Paul and Timothy is you have to remember, as we've gone through this letter, Timothy is experiencing a lot of difficulty in the church. He is experiencing a lot of conflict in the church. He's seeing a lot of the church people 
who have, I mean, yes, it's a young church, yes, it's a new church, but he's seeing false teachers, he's seeing people who they thought would be with them, abandoning them, he's seeing people who are judging him, so he's probably having that idea of, okay, is everybody like this? Again, that's an ancient thing, right? We never deal with that. But Paul is saying, no, Timothy, remember me. Remember me. As you think about the people who have hurt you, as you think about the people who are failing, as you think about the people who are doing it wrong, remember me. And you know that Timothy traveled with Paul a lot, that he knew he saw Paul do something stupid. Timothy probably saw Paul lose his anger at some point or get frustrated or be me. Paul was not a perfect person, and Timothy probably knew those things as well, but he didn't expect him to be perfect. He expected him to be faithful. And so Paul's holding himself up. Timothy, within all the bad examples, remember the good example. Remember, a lot of times that's why I even do the things I do. Some of you see the things that maybe I share or post or whatever. It's typically not for any of you. It's for the people I know who are in my youth group who are abandoned God right now because of what they see in the church. It's the people who I grew up with going to Christian school with who don't want anything with God now because of what they've seen in the church. And I hope that by maybe just sharing some of the things I think or believe, because I am by far not the perfect person of a a perfect example of a Christian, but I hope that they remember the things we've done or the things that I taught them or even the reality that maybe somebody thinks different and it's like, hey, there's a different example out here. And maybe that helps you as well. But that's what Paul is doing. Timothy, it's not all like this. Remember me. Timothy knew how to live, live for Jesus through the worst of circumstances because he had seen Paul do it time and time again. And so this is the thing that we have to think about, the implications of this. Here's the first implication of this paragraph. One is this. Are we being wary of people who derail us? If the only people you have speaking into your life are people who don't love Jesus, then that's not going to help your spiritual life. We need to have people in our lives who don't know Jesus. You need to have relationships with people that don't think the way that you do and don't believe the way that you do. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. That needs to happen. But if the only people in you have in your life are complainers and critics and people who uh, doubt the reality of God, like in a, not in a processing type way, but an antagonistic type way, then you have to, you have to acknowledge the reality of what that's going to do to your own heart. If you only have people in your life who are just living the list that Paul talked about, if that's, the, if that's like the description of the people that you are allowing to invest in you, that stuff is contagious. It's going to bleed into your heart. It's going to influence you. It's going to impact you. It's going to have a negative impact. Paul, Paul is basically kind of getting to Timothy here, the positive thing of what he says to the Corinthians in that letter. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And so again, it isn't that we're looking for saints only in our lives. But you have to be mindful of the people that you allow to speak into your life? Are they pointing you to Jesus? Are they pointing you to Jesus? And you know what? I hope it goes without saying, but maybe it doesn't. I hope that that bleeds into beyond just friendships. I hope as we start, many of you of our singles start, if you think about dating and relationships, does the person point you to Jesus? Because if not, they're never going to. Yes, they can meet him. Yes, that would be great. But you have to go based on what you know. And if they're not pointing you to Jesus, you can't bank on them doing that. You want to be with somebody who's going to point you to the Lord. Are we wary of, being, of people being, who will derail us? Second thing is, do we have people in our lives who refresh us and point us to Jesus? Do we have people in our lives who refresh us and point us to Jesus? Paul already mentioned this earlier in the letter. He talks about these two people. I thought they would always be with me, but they left. But then he talks about Onesimus, this guy who wasn't ashamed of my shortcomings, 
wasn't ashamed of my chains, wasn't ashamed of the difficulties I am, but constantly seeking me out and refreshing me. Do you have people like that in your life? Who even though you might fail, even though you might mess up, even though they might disagree with you, are seeking you out and trying to refresh you. I know for me, over the last six months, I've been talking with somebody, a counselor who's been just helping me process the last two years and a lot of different things, and he's a former pastor. And there's different things that before I started talking to him, it's like, man, is this, am I reading this wrong? Or am I feeling this way, like wrong about how this went down? Or am I seeing this conversation? Like, I just, like, just man, like guilt or shame about it. Then I talked to him about the exact same things, and he goes, oh my goodness, I can't imagine how that felt. That's exactly how you should be reading that. That's what happens. And affirming somebody who knew what it was like, somebody who's been there before, who were saying, yes, that's exactly how you should feel in that moment. No, that isn't right when somebody does that. No, that's putting things on you. You need to be, here's how we can process that. He's been where I am at now, and he's able to speak into things, and it has been the most refreshing thing in the entire world. Do you have people in your life who can speak into your life? And again, it might be a mentor type role. It might be something like that, but it has to be beyond that. This is the need for community. This is the need for doing life together. This is one of the reasons why in our community groups, we try to do an emphasis, not just on getting into the word, but also just asking what's been going on this week? What's been happening? How are you doing? To know the different things so we can speak into one another's lives. Because one of the things that gets brought up in a group might be something that somebody else has gone through and they can share and encourage you. And if no one in the group can, gets it, we can find somebody who gets it to help you. You need community. You need community. And don't allow the last difficulties of the last two years to be an excuse for not being in community. Just means we have to be a little bit more creative in how we be in community. And for some of us, it's an issue of, okay, the last two years has been difficult. It's time to pick it up, get, in that, get back to normal, and get into community and not have excuses on that. Do we have people in our lives who refresh us and point us to Jesus? It all comes down to what Proverbs says. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. It's going to get difficult, Paul says. You're going to be a person like this swimming against the stream. You need to swim with somebody. You need somebody to walk with you. He also says, though, you need a map. Keep going by being a learner and doer of the word. Keep going by being a learner and a doer of the word. Paul's going to say in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's basically reminding Timothy what he already said at the beginning of the letter about his grandma and about his mom and how they made him aware of the scriptures from an early age. So this is just kind of reminding Timothy again of what he's always known. But what he's reminding him is that you, even from when you were younger, you're seeing the importance of scripture. Excuse me, do we see the importance of scripture? In our day, whenever we need to find something out, what do we do? We Google it. Even the, that phrase, Google it, to search on the internet. You might not even be using Google, but we Google it, that kind of idea. We know what that means. So we Google movie times, we, move, we Google recipes, we Google the weather, we Google directions, what day is Christmas on, need a mechanic. We Google all of these different things. In a tech-based, information-based age, your internet browser becomes the go-to place if you need to figure anything out. Just Google it. Counter to our natural cultural inclination, though, God wants his word to be our go-to on the people that we are and how we live. He doesn't want us to Google life. He wants us to scripture life. How do I keep going in this marriage? Scripture that. Keep going in this job? Scripture that. 
How do I discipline my kids while at the same time showing them grace and love? Scripture that. Live in purity. Scripture that. Have standards in work. Scripture that. Use. Googling something gives us earthly information. Scripturing something. Scripturing it gives us the wisdom of God. And so whatever the thing is that you're going through, regardless how big or small, regardless of how fun or painful, mundane or crucial, do we go with Google or just earthly wisdom, or do we go to Scripture? I Google it when I go off of my own ideas. I Google it when I lean on the best how-tos. I Google it when I lead with what's easiest, best, or most fun for me. But I Scripture it when I realize God's wisdom is best. And what is his character? I Scripture it when I lean into his character and his direction. I scripture it when I lead with, how do I honor God and love people in this moment? Now, clarification, really important clarification here. There's some things the Bible doesn't talk about. So there's some things we have to figure out in life. What doctor do I go to? Do I go to a doctor that aren't in the Bible? So there's things that are seen as earthly wisdom, if you will, that are important for us, that we need to know. If you're going to build a house, you're not going to find the plans for how to build a house in the Bible. But you'll find wisdom on who you want to create contracts with and how to manage your resources and how to go about that particular job. Does that make sense? And so there's some things that aren't in Scripture, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. The difference is is that what we see in Scripture has authority for who we are as people. That's the thing that Paul's going to get into next. He says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is where the Bible is different. This is God-breathed. The Holy Spirit directed the authors of Scripture precisely, but not coercing them. The Holy Spirit created the thought and gave understanding, resulting in the writer choosing one particular word over another. Not, I was inspired to do something, but moved by God, God breathed these words. Josh McDowell talks about Scripture and what this means by all Scripture is breathed out by God. He says this, Scripture was inspired by God so he could reveal his thoughts, words, and promises in order that we could have them preserved from generation to generation. So the Bible is a special revelation of God, written by human authors who were inspired directly by him. And because of that, the Bible carries power and weight. It has authority. Behind the Bible stands the sovereign God of the universe, and when he speaks, his word defines the essence of authority. So that's the difference as far as why we see the Bible, is that this book has authority on the people that we are as we live for God. There are things that we encounter in the world that are really important wisdom and information that we can glean from. They might not have that authority, but they're still beneficial. If it's something that is, goes against or is out of sync with what God says, then we need to avoid that. That's our heaters. That's not like a creepy Halloween ploy on some of you. So just to let you know if you're new here. Um, if, it, if it's against that, then we avoid it. But if it's not, and we can be faithful to God and who we are within that, then it might not be a bad thing. And in many ways, it could even be a good thing. And so in that, science isn't bad. Medicine isn't bad. Psychology isn't bad. Any more than mechanics aren't bad and teaching isn't bad and any other discipline that we have in the world. We need to think about the different things and think critically. We can be a faithful follower of Jesus being truthful to his word when we partake of the different things that God has allowed people to learn and understand and how the world works. Does that make sense? So I feel like we kind of need that clarification about what the Bible is and what the Bible isn't. But what is the Bible trying to do? Well, he tells us it's for teaching. Scripture instructs us in the character and the plan of God. Not just information for information's sake, but we can't change our behavior unless we change our thinking. And so learning a new way of thinking gives us a new way of life. We understand who God is. It's good for reproof. It gives evidence of our shortcomings. 
not to shame us, not to beat us up, but it's, you know, my kids are in sports and they, you know, hey, Bailey, you're not dribbling the ball correctly. Let me show you how to dribble that. Well, it's not to beat her up. It's not to say she's a bad player. It's you're dribbling that wrong. Let me show you how to do it right. So you have to see the ways we're doing something wrong to know how to do something correctly. Hence the next thing, correction. Scripture puts us on a path to restoration, to help things be made right. Training. Scripture gives guidance on how to live for God. Training in righteousness. Again, the picture of a coach in practice or a drill instructor, personal trainer, helping us know what is holy and how to live for him. When we think about keeping going with the Lord, the guide that we need, scripture, the map that we need, scripture is meant to teach us, to give us correct reproof, correct, and train. Scripture is going to help us keep going because God never intended for us to be stuck. He says in verse 17 that the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Scripture prepares us for everything, to be the people that he wants us to be. There might be some things outside the Bible that we need to read in order to understand the situation in life that we're in, but as far as the people that we are within it, Scripture prepares us for everything. The emphasis is on who we are as his people. There are situations in life that we can't handle, but Scripture provides the wisdom we need to keep going through those situations. Scripture points us to the value, what values to embrace. It points us to the commands to obey, the promises to hold on to, the family of God to walk with. We need to be people in the word. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the Bible to you? Is it something, is it just another app on your phone? Is it a book somewhere at home? something you might carry around on Sundays but not do anything else with the rest of the week? I want to challenge you to be in the Word, to daily depend on God through an understanding of His Word. And so daily, I want to challenge you to pick a time and pick a text. When is a time in your day that you can spend 10 or 15 minutes in the Word of God? Notice I didn't say three hours. 10 or 15 minutes. Maybe you have a train ride. Maybe you have a car commute and you can listen to it. Maybe you have a lunch break. Maybe the kids are down and you have a little bit of time afterwards or when you you wake up 15 minutes early. But when is 15 minutes you can be in the Word? And then what can you read? Not being just random and just flipping around and pointing, but maybe you read through Proverbs. Whatever the date is, read that chapter of Proverbs. Read through the Gospels. If you go download the New Life app, just go into your app store and look for New Life Community Church, or go to YouVersion. We have the Bible in our church app. YouVersion has the Bible and tons of different reading plans. Do something, but then also depend on it. What are you learning from the Word? What does it tell you as far as the person that you are? Maybe the thing that you're going through, what, is the, what does this book tell me about being a parent? a spouse, a friend, a student, a coworker, whatever that might be. We need to ask those questions as well. We have to keep going, and you're going to need not only a guide, but the map to do it. Things are going to be difficult. We already all know that. Is life difficult? Yes. Some of it is so difficult, even just nodding the head is a difficult thing to acknowledge that it can be difficult. You might not be in that season right now, but we know what that season's like. We need people around us, and we need the Word of God. But the reality is, out of all of it, we need God. You can have a guide, and you can have a map, and be clueless about the person that they're pointing to. And so it isn't just about getting some smart life antidotes. It's not just about having some little spiritual one-liners you can hang on the wall. It's about having that relationship with God. It's about knowing that God loved you so much that he sent, sent his son to die in your place, that all of the brokenness that comes from sin can be healed because sin is forgiven, that you can be a new person with a new identity based in joy and peace and mercy and grace and purpose. That is something our world can't give us. 
And we know what the reality of that brokenness that co- that's caused by sin is like. And we do everything we can to go to different things to try to fix it and heal it, but none of it can. Nothing that we go to can deal with the brokenness in our hearts, our lives that comes from the reality of sin in our life or others' lives or the world's life. It's only when we turn to God that we experience the one who can forgive our sin and heal brokenness. And so you need to stop looking to other things and look to him. The reality of his love on the cross is he took our sin, the world's sin upon himself, so that his righteousness could be put on us, so that he could forgive, so he could restore And if you've never trusted that, if you've never put your faith in that, if you've never turned to him and put the allegiance of your life, said, I'm following him, then you're just carrying a book and knowing a couple people. The guide and the map aren't going to be ultimately very helpful because you don't know the one they're about. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, that's the thing that you need to do. But if you have... Why aren't you relying on a map, the, the Bible? Why aren't you in it? And why do we not have God, people walking with us? We need others and we need the word. That's about as basic and practical as it could get. And it's usually the basic practical things that we need to be reminded of. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much again just for the fact that you are so patient with us. We thank you that you are so merciful. We thank you for your enduring love. God, we thank you that you keep your promises and you tell us that if we need wisdom and we ask that you will give us wisdom. You tell us that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. God, I pray that you would give us a hunger for your word, to know who you are, to know how to navigate life, to know how to encourage others, to know how to be a part of what you're doing. I pray, God, that you would raise up people that we could talk with and glean from and be encouraged by, that we wouldn't go through life in isolation, but that we could do it together. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to community and the need to connect with people, people who will point us to Jesus. God, I thank you for the fact that you love us and for anyone in here, anyone who's listening, God, online that doesn't know you, let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day that they find you. It's in your name that we pray, amen. We're going to close with this last song, so would you stand with us as we worship him?